I welcome you for the second part of our today's session, where we cover Europe for the first um, round. And our speaker is again um, someone that we are very familiar with, who, is, who entertained us in the past, but also caused some conflictual conversations during our Q&A sessions, and we're really looking forward to having that again. So let us start with um, Evariste Lefebvre from Netixis. He's the chief economist for North America, and he'll cover Europe this time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It's true, I just watched a video of 2011 and uh, I, it, basically the fighting was not recorded. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, I was already making a speech about the Euro area or the Eurozone, whatever it is. And um, by the time we were just talking about Brexit already. Uh, so it's still one of the question, and if there is a Q and A session, maybe I will have another question on Brexit whatsoever. But interestingly enough, by the time the big question was was also about uh, contagion, contagion to Spain, the big question was who's next, because Greek, the Greek case was almost done, and everybody was wondering what was going to happen. And uh, the situation has changed drastically since then. And interestingly enough, the previous presentation took a 30 year uh, to have some big changes, or at least 15 to 20 years to have some big changes of big players in Latin America. Uh, in three years time, we've had so many changes, institutionally speaking, economically speaking, reform-wise speaking, I would say, in the euro area, so that all the conditions for uh, an interesting recovery, sound recovery, are, are, are made today. So I will start with uh, a glimpse on what's going on, why is it cyclically interesting, what, uh, what, is going what is happening now, and then I will try to give you a few details on Greece, what we think about Greece, and go a little bit further on try to figure out what could be the uh, market implication of that situation, and especially if you have some questions on the EU, I will try to uh, provide you with an answer. So if I had to spend one hour on one chart, it would be this one. Because if you look at this chart, you have absolutely everything on what's been going on in the US and in the Euro area as well. This is just a very simple chart where you have in purple the US and in orange uh, the Euro zone. And what you can see basically, uh, the thick line is investment, not as a share of GDP, just investment. And the dotted lines are earning per share, let's say a good proxy of profits. What is, great, what is interesting in that chart is basically if you look at the 2009-2010 period, you had some similar patterns in terms of recovery, even though uh, the Eurozone was already lagging behind. But what is very most interesting in that chart is basically the amount of GDP, the amount of capital accumulation, the amount of wealth that has been destroyed, or at least that has not been accumulated in Europe over that period. So it's clearly the sign of a lost half decade, I would say. If you look at the US, the recovery is well underway. I mean, we had a presentation on that, and I subscribe to this analysis. There is still some pent-up demand, and people tend to forget the supply side of the US to, to stress to, to what extent it's very important and still positive for the, for the future. Even the, if, if, above all for a closed economy, I was very well stressed before. What is important here in those charts is basically that the, what will make this recovery a long-lasting recovery is basically what's go, what will happen in terms of investment spending. There is a strong need of investment, capital accumulation in Europe. So there are some structural hurdles, which are basically the, the trend in demographics, the huge amount of saving that is used to finance public deficits. But by the way, now that I will show you some, some charts that there is something cyclical going on, if there is no recovery after that in investment spending, basically it will be more than a half a decade lost. It will be even worse. So that's very important to, to bear that in mind. Cyclically speaking, you can clearly see some very important points here. You can see uh, that in terms of expectations, but also in terms of spending, things are going much better in Europe. What is interesting here is basically uh, what happened is a mix of two things. We had a crisis in 2011, which was a sovereign 
crisis, banking crisis, but it was also a very big cyclical crisis that was driven by a huge policy mistake as well. Uh, remember that this very sharp slowdown was also triggered by a very significant tightening of monetary policy uh, carried out by the ECB. So the ECB has been criticized for, uh, of course, recently be going much far beyond its mandate. But remember that in 2011, the ECB went very far beyond its mandate, tried to fight against an inflation that was mostly driven by commodity prices, which means basically inflation that was driven by factors on which monetary policy had absolutely no impact. But that's where we are. Let's, let's look at the bright side. And if you look at this chart, you can see that basically there is something interesting uh, going on. And what is very interesting in that recovery is that it's a recovery that has not been uh, uh, done through the help of uh, solid countries. Basically, if we were in a normal, uh, and if there was any kind of uh, economic solidarity within the Eurozone, we would clearly have had a very different pattern than this one. If you look at those charts, I, I have a microphone actually, yes, sure. So if you look at these charts, you can see that almost everywhere, everywhere you had an improvement in budget balance and in current account balance. The only Finland doesn't matter, and those are small countries. Even France managed to have a stabilization of its current account balance, but the worst of the, of the worsening was, was carried out before. But Netherlands, Spain, Germany, Ireland, every country was able to improve its public balances and also external balances. And this was done at the expense of growth, basically, because it was a little bit of export, especially for a country such as Germany and so on, but the improvement in the current account balance was clearly triggered and done through a very strong adjustment of, uh, of domestic spending. But let's forget about this. Now we have the, the, the recovery is a combination of many, many important factors. You cannot find a better backdrop for an economy to recover. It's clearly economy, Econ 101. It's textbook economics. You have positive shocks from the outside, you have domestic conditions, you have fiscal and monetary policy going in the good direction, very, very accommodative. And on top of that, you have an improvement on the, on the, on the structural side, namely on the banking system, and in some areas uh, in the functioning of the good and labor markets. So I won't go that much into the details of that, but frankly speaking, the big shock, the big positive shock for every uh, Every advanced economy was very sharp fall in oil and commodity prices. Uh, I won't come back on the reason for that, but what you can see basically is that energy imports declined very sharply. That was a very positive shock, very positive way of gaining purchasing power at a time where wages were still not growing very sharply. So the deflation that we had was uh, not pure deflation. It was deflation driven by oil uh, price going down, and that was very healthy in the sense that it provided purchasing power to households. And we've seen yesterday some very good data in Europe, which are in some ways explained by uh, the better uh, condition for spending by households. And the other factor as well, basically, uh, was a sharp decline in the uh, euro, uh, ex euro, uh, euro dollar exchange rate with a sharp improvement in net exports. It's, it works all the time, but there, but this was, the, this was the crisis, and during the crisis you had a sharp increase in the US dollar, for safe haven reason, people were scrambling because they were in dire need of dollars, and at the same time the world trade was collapsing. So this relationship is working. So it's good. You have lower oil prices, which is very good, even better than the US because we don't produce oil. And second, uh, I mean, when I say we, we it's Euro, 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 Euro area, of course, and a much weaker currency. On top of that, you have a very accommodative environment. Fiscal policy is not dire. There will be some adjustment in budget balance. People are going, countries are going to try to consolidate their, uh, uh, their public account, but it will be done very smoothly. The European Commission is not asking for a very strong adjustment uh, this time. So, and on top of that, there is plenty of money. A very good indicator of recession in Europe, if you want to have one one day, is to look at M1, that is a narrow definition of money, uh, adjusted by, of, of inflation. And you can see that generally it leads quite well uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cyclical uh, trend of the economy. So once again, monetary and fiscal policy are adding to the 
FX, foreign exchange, and commodity shock to provide some strong support to the uh, economic growth. On top of that, we've had a lot, a succession of strong improvements in the banking system in, 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 in Europe. You had uh, the implementation of uh, stress tests, asset quality review, some new rules, some strong improvement in the, uh, in the balance sheet, more capital accumulation. So all those factors are opening the way, I would say, at last to a rebound in credit. We were all expecting a creditless recovery and now on top of that, we have a slight, a very slight, but we have an improvement in the distribution in credit in Europe, of credit in Europe. So that adds to the positive factors. It's very important, why? Because basically, if you look at the sources of SME financing in Euros, it's basically uh, mostly uh, do, uh, done through uh, bank loans on return earnings on trade credit. So bank loans were very, very limiting the growth of SMEs in Europe, and that's another uh, positive for, for the area. Last point, as I said, we need investment. And what makes investment uh, flourish in Europe? Once again, big difference with the US. It's not that much return earning it's mostly access to banking. And if you look at this chart on the left there, you can clearly see that the banking, the banks that are just easing their tightening, their, their lending standards are clearly increasing. So this is generally a good indicator of a recovery in investment spending. And if you look at this chart, you can see, and it is very important as well to bear that in mind, is that stock prices on investment spending are very closely related in Europe. So if you have an improvement in stock prices, which it means that the price of capital is lower, and at the end of the day, you may expect some, some more spending. So there are some big differences. In Spain and, and Germany, the banking sector is very sound. There have been, it's been able to repair its balance sheet very quickly. France and Italy are still lagging behind, but if you look at yesterday's data, for instance, in the case of France, the share of profits in the value added has been increasing, which means that here also there are some improvements in the, uh, in the situation, fiscal situation, I mean, financial situation of the uh, banking system of the corporate sector, sorry, in Europe. So if you add all this together, you have a very bright picture, right? Could give you more details, but we are expecting at Atixis an increase of 1.7 of GDP growth this year, and next year more or less the same level. Uh, Germany might not be the leader this time, but anyway, France is doing quite well. And by the way, if you look at uh, France, Germany contribution to European growth since 1999, France has done better still again. So it's very important to bear that in mind. It's not only driven by the external sector and external shocks, it's also driven by domestic improvement. And uh, the big lesson of that is that the reason why the US economy was able to get very quickly out of the crisis there were, two, there were two reasons for that. One of the reasons was luck, and the luck is to have a lot of oil in the system. And uh, the other luck, which is bad luck, is to have a very low cost of labor because it did, the wages of the middle class were not raised for two decades. But beyond that <coughs> luck, there was freedom. And the freedom was the ability to let your currency go wherever you wanted, the ability to use your public finances to do whatever you wanted, even though people were criticizing very sharply the Bush slash Obama uh, fiscal policy, but basically the deficit was 8% of GDP, now it's close to 2 So it works when you have some leeway. And the third point was the ability to carry out the monetary policy you wanted. So it's very simple. When you have flexibility in the, carrier, in, in the way you can manage your, your, your economic policy, in general, you get better, which was not the case of Europe as well. So, but there is still a big problem. The big problem is, of course, Greece. Uh, it's been now more, almost 100 days since we have a new administration in Greece, and so far we cannot say that uh, any of the problem regarding the future of debt uh, has been settled. So I won't be very long on that. What I would say is that we still have a little bit of time, and the time that we have is uh, driven by uh, the redemption schedule of many uh, of the debt that is, hold by, is, uh, that the debt is owed by, uh, by Greece. 
And the most important of all is not that much the IMF. You've seen uh, earlier this week that the IMF payment has been carried out. There will be another one that will be probably done recently, scrambling around, trying to talk to municipalities, pension funds, wherever they can to get some money, even using S SDR. And S SDR is not money, but basically trying to use it to, to, to pay back. But you cannot pay back the ECB when you owe the ECB in June and July close to 7 billion euros. So that's where the problem is. So if, you, if I had to summarize the situation very simply to you is, the, here is the situation of Greece. We, have, we are in the second bailout program. And the discussion now uh, are about something that was supposed to, be, uh, to have been settled in February the 20th this year, the third tranche of this program should be paid against, of course, all the conditions that are uh, in general uh, coming with that in terms of implementation of reforms and so on. So now the Greek are going to get uh, probably later in June or earlier in June the money uh, 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 that is associated with the third tranche of this second bailout program. So we won't have any default this summer. That's all called. We really believe that it's, that it's the case. But is it, are we done now with Greece or not? We are not at all. Because the very assumption a few years back was that Greece will come back into the market and be able to issue its debt and uh, issue some bonds as early as next September. And if you take... So this September and go up to the end of 2016, Greece needs to uh, borrow at least 17 billion euros in the market to finance the redemption of bonds on loan that, that are coming forward. So you have to, give, to be prepared. There will be some volatility in the next few weeks for the payment of the third tranche of the second program. And after that, the big topic will be what next? And will we have a third bailout or will we have a uh, uh, some kind of renegotiation of debt or uh, uh, a new, uh, a, a, a redemp uh, sorry, a, par a, par a, par a partial redemption, uh, partial adjustment, some debt write-offs, let's see. In, in a way, it's not that a big deal. What is the risk there? The risk, if you remember well, uh, the reason why we had two bailouts uh, of Greece uh, in the past, and especially in 2009, was this. The bank exposure to quick risk. The holding, as you can see here, of Greek bonds by European banks was tremendous. So we had a very strong risk of a vicious cycle with Greek defaulting, then banks having some uh, huge increase in default on the strong recapitalization needs, and then the need to bail out those banks, especially since in Europe, by the time, uh, any bail-in or implication of private investor in the losses was excluded. So the situation, as you can see, is completely different. First of all, now, uh, most, uh, the, the, the spirit has completely changed. If there is any crisis of that kind in the future, well, basically, the bail-in is here, and uh, owner of equity will also be wiped out. And second, basically, the exposure is very low. So who's most exposed to a default now? It's very interesting. German banks, probably a bunch of uh, London's bank and so on. And the other ones are US and UK banks, exposed for reasons they, they, they know themselves, but it's completely different. So that's a very important, a very important thing to, uh, to, to, to bear in mind. Second, so it's, it's not a biggie, but is it necessary? Is it, some, is, it, is it something clever? Some people will tell you, uh, Yes, but if you look at the uh, adjustment in, in unit labor costs that we have registered in Greece, in Greece over the last few, few years, well, basically, the competitiveness is back. And the problem of Greece is not that much a level of competitiveness. It's a very limited share of exports in GDP. It's 13% of If you compare with Ireland or even with, with uh, Portugal, it's very tiny. So what the point in having a default on an, on an exit based on those sole arguments that basically you have already, what kind of gain will you, will you get? So I won't spend too much time, that's why I wrote it and you will have access to, uh, to, the, to, the, to, to, to the rationale for an exit. But basically to, to, to summarize it very quickly, 
if you have the, the, the problem in Europe and in Greece is you think that a default will lead you to an exit. And why so? Uh, basically, if you take the case of some American city or Amer American uh, uh, counties, well, basically, you can default and stay in the, in the, in the, in the, in the area. But that, the situation is very different. Uh, first point that I stress in this slide, basically, is uh, if you default and you stay in the Eurozone, you don't gain in terms of competitiveness. But as I said, it doesn't matter because there has been a strong increase in competitiveness so far. And second, uh, basically, when you have nothing to export, it doesn't matter really if you are very competitive or not. But the problem, basically, is um, the, the problem? Is, the problem basically for, for Greece is uh, who provides liquidity first to the, to the government and to the banks. And the big issue is not that much a government because Greece has already a structural a primary balance. So basically, it means that they make they. They, 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 they have a, a, a balance, a public balance that is above zero before interest payment. So if there is no interest payment to be made because there is a default on the debt, so basically the situation is more or less sustainable. Probably more important is the banking system. If you default, basically the banking system will completely die because the banking system is already depending very sharply, very highly, tremendously, I would say, uh, on, on, uh, on the money provided by um, by, um, by the ECB. So I still have a few minutes left, so I will go very quickly. But basically, if you summarize the situation of Greece, uh, I would say that uh, there is this uh, joke, but I'm very bad at jokes, actually. But uh, anyway, I will try to, to tell it to you. But it's, it's a story of this English guy that is lost in Ireland. And uh, he gets into a bar, and, uh, and he's, he wants to go back to London. And he asks some guys at the bar, and he says, well, basically, uh, what is the best way to, uh, to go back to London? And then the guys look at him and say, well, I will not start from here. So that's basically, you know, it's not funny. But second, that's basically where, uh, that's basically where. My, my wife says she's funny, but it must be for, for, for some other reasons, actually. But anyway, but um, that's the story. I mean, the problem with Greece is from the point where we're starting. It's not that much. Uh, we, we should have done it five years ago, and now we're very closely stuck with that. So. Negative interest rates. I will. I, I suppose. I guess that you are much more interested by the euro, uh, the value of the euro, than by the fact that a lot of uh, yields are below zero in Europe. But basically, that's a problem of sending a presentation in advance because now uh, the share of negative yield is much lower than what it was. Because as you may have noticed, interest rate, interest rates are spiking up in Europe. I mean, basically, ten-year bond is like 0.6. 0.7%, which is amazing, but anyway, everybody's very nervous about it. Uh, the, question, the question mark, and wh why is the euro recovering? The euro recover is recovering uh, because the dollar is getting weaker, so that's the best and easiest answer to, to give. Uh, but basically, it's in, in a way, it's true. There was the, the exposure, the long position on the US dollar were very were tremendous. That's what we call a, a crowded trade. So there were some adjustment had to be made. It was not justified. A stronger dollar is justified. But the, the, the problem was not the direction of the dollar, but the pace of the appreciation. So that we know for sure. And if you look at the chart on the left, basically, if you, if you can clearly see that uh, the, the, the euro clearly overshot uh, the level that was implied by the interest rate differential between both uh, economies. And the second way to see that is there is something called the news flow. And the news flow is the positive versus negative surprise on the, eco on the economy. You can see that the euro was going down, but there was some strong improvement in the news flow in, in, in Europe. That's, there was something unsustainable in that, in that direction. So that's very important to, to bear that in mind. Everybody was also con concerned by the fact that the ECB was going to increase and is going to increase the size of its balance sheet. And we made some calculation at Natexis, and we said that if you assume that the size of the balance sheet of the Fed is going to remain stable and the size of the balance sheet of the ECB is going to increase as expected, basically you can expect euro, a euro close to 0.85. So that's a fear factor. But basically the reason why the euro is strong because remember the chart I showed you at the beginning. We had a strong improvement in balance in the current account balance everywhere in Europe. So at the end of the day, you have this very interesting situation, which is a current account balance, which is more than two percent of GDP, the highest ever. 
huge saving. So when you have a current account balance, basically what you have is more supply than demand of your own currency. And this is exactly what happened to Japan. Japan had a strong current account balance in 2003, 2009. And by the time, you can see, there were, even though they were exporting capital, basically the supply of yen was lower than, the, than anything else. So you had a strong appreciation of the currency. And remember, the, the weakness of the yen was driven by two things. The first was, of course, the ch completely ch the change in the policy of the Bank of Japan, but also about the fact that suddenly, and because of the earthquake and so on, a sharp decline in the current account. So the reason why the euro cannot fall too much, it's just because there is a, a current account that is positive. So here is a paradox for Europe. If there is a strong recovery with more investment, more domestic spending, then you may have a weaker euro. So it will be the recovery that will be driving the euro much further, lo much lower than the lower euro helping that much uh, the, uh, the, the eurozone. So it's a, it's a little bit of a paradox, but basically that's what you see here. This is the limit for a much weaker, uh, much weaker, much weaker euro. So I, 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 and it, if you have more questions, maybe there is a Q and A, and I can also uh, talk to any one of you after that. Um, that's that's the situation that we expect for Europe this year. 1.7, white point seven. Germany is going to do well. France is doing is going to do okay. And as you can see, uh, Spain is the winner here. 2.8 percent. Spain is doing very well. Spain is benefiting not that much from reform that has been that have been carried out just after the crisis, but mostly from reform that were done in uh, the decade previously, so that's very important. Reforms that have been carried out in the past pay off after a while. Reforms that are carried out during bad times don't pay off and worsen the crisis in general. So that's, that's, that's a nice picture, and as you can see, you have a, a, a growth gap between uh, the euro area and uh, the United States that is uh, getting, uh, that is shrinking a little bit, and it's uh, it's it's rather a good news for 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 the uh, global economy. And this is coupled with a sharp fall of commodity prices, something that we could call the revenge of the uh, developed world. And uh, that may last at least a few years, given the very uh, bad uh, and. Uh, picture that we have has been in LATAM, and I don't know what you're going to tell us, but basically I'm not that much uh, confident on many other uh, emerging markets. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm open for questions after that. Thank you very much.